Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Well, again, Thanksgiving coming up. So how many of y'all are having company come to your house you're hosting and and gonna have the people in so who who do you got coming us we're going to delicious yay we're excited about that okay so church church folks invited in some church folks have a angela friends and your mom yeah family members too Okay, it's like grown, grown ad- adult children coming home. So isn't that nice? Because isn't that one of the wonderful things that Thanksgiving is about, that we can um, invite those people, come back in, come on home, especially, you know, our grown kids and family members, maybe some that we don't see a whole lot of the times, so that come on in. And, uh, you know, if we're not having friends over at our house or, or company, maybe we're going to go to somebody else's and be there at, at that table. It's just a fun time to to celebrate, to be together, and to um, just put aside anything else and just enjoy and be thankful for what God has given to us. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know that there's that invitation, and we serve a God who who loves to celebrate too and who likes to he's planning a big feast for us one day and everybody is invited everybody is included and and God wants folks to come it's just amazing to me how much God wants to be in relationship with us you know we've been talking this whole last year walking with God through this this particular study that we call you know we make the road by walking and a time for spiritual growth, a time to try and get to know God better. And so you might recall that a year ago, when we began this journey on the first Sunday of December, um, we read about creation, or we started back at the very beginning. And so it's like, well, what are the, the, begin, the first page of the Bible? What are the first four words in the Bible? 
If you look at Genesis 1, chapter 1, anyway, verse 1, what does it say? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And so then last week we went all the way to the end of the book in Revelation and talked about or looked at what the plans that God has at the very end. Now in McLaren's book, as we've been looking at this, he begins this final chapter talking about the end of the world. You know, God has created this world. He made this beautiful world. Kind of, uh, God has existed forever and sort of as, as an outgrowth of just his love and his relationship with, with his own self. Um, God created this, this magnificent world. And one day it might all come to an end. You know, so scientists will say, well, the, the universe itself might collapse. I, I mean, it's been expanding. Maybe it's going to collapse, Wh whatever. We might get sucked into a black hole or, or who knows. There could be any number of things that could happen. We'll get Earth, might, our star might, our sun might explode or, or burn up or something. Or, or maybe there'd be an asteroid. It's like, well, all of those things could be millions and billions of years away. But of course, we know mankind also has the ability, we, through our own stupidity, to, to destroy life on the planet too, either through uh, nuclear, nuclear activity or, or overconsumption and pollution and all these kinds of things. We can wipe out life on the planet. But it's like, even if this world comes to an end, we, we read last, last week about God creating a new heaven and a new earth, when we turn to the very last verses in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 20 and 21, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So in the beginning, God. In the end. God. God is going to be there. He is, he is eternal. He is forever there. And as long when we are in Christ, we also are going to be with God. We will be in, in God forever. Um, I don't know what all God has planned for eternity when this earth and this universe might be gone, but we'll be together with him. God is like the, the bookends of, our, of the story of our lives. He's there at the beginning. He's there at the end the Alpha and the Omega, and every page in between, leading us to that place, drawing us closer that we can know God and, and walk with him every day. And so it's exciting because God has a plan. Whatever it is at the end of, a, of, of this life and the end of, of life as we know it, God's got a feast. He's got a, a celebration. He likes to plan parties. We serve a God who likes to party. So we're going to be with him. And Every one of us is invited. Now, when Christ came, you know, we look forward to the coming of Christ. When he comes the second time and such, or when he came the first time, he said that he, one of the many things that he came to do, I mean, he came for several reasons, but one of his primary reasons was to reveal to us the Father and to let us know so we can know God better. We can have that deeper relationship with God and know him better. And um, one of the ways he did that was by talking with the folks and, and telling them stories about God, you know, that would illustrate who the Father is. And one of our favorite stories is this story about the, we call the prodigal son. But this really does give us a good illustration of God and his, his love for us. So he tells the story of, of a man who had two sons. Three important characters in the story, you know, the father and his heart of love and compassion, his forgiving nature to invite, to welcome the, the sons back in when they've strayed. We have the, the one son, the, the older son, who's the good boy, who's, you know, in those days, the older son was the one who, who pretty much inherited everything. You know, if a family was wealthy, most everything went to the, the lion's share went to the to the older son. And so he's the important one. He's the one who's like the in crowd, you know. He's the one who walks close with, with God. He, he's the one who's there with his father. He's very obedient. He's good, you know. He does everything right and, and such, at least when 
he thinks the father's not looking or, or, or watching. Um, the younger son, though, you know, he's, he's different because he, he's kind of like, well, it's kind of the outside group, you know, the outer group and a little bit more rebellious. And, and he's like, well, if I'm going to have anything, I've got to get it myself. I've got to do it myself, though I think he still has this, clearly this sense of entitlement. He's like, well, the world owes me a living. So, you know, give me my money, Dad. Give me my inheritance. He goes, asks his father for his inheritance before his father's even died. So that's really audacious. But, um, you know, he's, he's the one that thinks he's just going to do it all by himself. So off he goes. He takes his money, runs off, and, and thinks he's just going to make it on his own. And it's a, apparently he thinks he's got to leave goes off to a far country, leaves his father behind, leaves everything behind, and apparently leaves wisdom behind as well because he goes and, and wastes everything he has on wild living. And, you know, of course, you're going to have plenty of friends while you've got the money and willing to spend it, and, and they're going to be right there helping you spend your money, and pretty soon everything's gone, and he finds himself. At least he's able then at that point in time to to go he, and um, get him a job. He finds the, takes the lowest, the meanest kind of work that he can find being there feeding the pigs. Now, he's one also, because he'd come, he, he remembers where he's come from, where he's been, and he knows there's a better life. So here he is in this pigsty, and I can tell I know, I've, I mean, I kind of was there myself one time. I think probably a lot of us have found ourselves in a place where we've wandered away from God. We've wandered away. We thought we could do it on our own. Thought we could just figure it out ourselves and live our own way. We wander off and we get ourselves into trouble and find ourselves into that pigsty. It's like, well, for me, when this, you know, I, I was... I was a teenager when I accepted Christ. And so I came to Christ as, as one who was as good as they come, 16 years old and pure. Um, so it was later in my 20s, you know, college years and, and 20s that I kind of, that I wandered off and um, got to that place where I was in the pigsty. And it's like, this is not who I want to be. This is not the life that I want to live because I knew God well enough to know there's a better life. There's a better way to follow. And so I knew what to do to go back to the Lord. And so, you know, when I came to my senses, that very next Sunday, I'm back in the local United Methodist Church. I'm talking to that pastor and saying, where's a Sunday school class that I can get in? You know, this young man, he knew what to do. He knew where to go. He could return home to his father. Maybe he knew his father well enough to know that his father would receive him and allow him back in. Um, now, he, it was customary in those, it, for Jewish people, if, if a son wanders off, of course, back in the real old days, if a son was rebellious, he could be, he could be stoned to death. But um, if he comes back, then he should not be received and welcomed back as a son. He should be received as a servant, if at all. Um, and so this is what the young man really could expect. And so he prepares his speech. He, he prepared to, to plead with his father and, and repent and you know, express his sorrow. And so he does. He comes back. And he's, he's starting to, to give his speech, but the father is so overjoyed to see him. The father is so delighted. He came, he's like he was watching for him to come. He rushes out and embraces him and, and won't even let him finish his speech. And he's like immediately treats him as a son again. He's like not even going to hear about considering him a servant. He's like, no, you are my beloved son. He clothes him with a, with a robe, even as God clothes us in righteousness when we return to Christ, when we return to God and come back. We've wandered off. We come back. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. He puts the rings on our fingers. He puts the ring on... The father gives a ring to say, no, you're an heir. You're my son. You are not, you are not an outsider. You're not out there. Um, and I would not have you as just a servant. You are my beloved son. 
And so he celebrates. He says, come on, let's party. Let's have a party and celebrate because my son was dead and now he is alive again and he has come home. He was lost, he's found. That which was gone has returned. And so he celebrates. He's excited. I, I love it that, you know, there's no condemnation in here. He doesn't fuss at the young man and say, see, I told you so. Oh, you had to find out, didn't you? So, boy, you really stink. He, there, no condemnation. He just receives him with love and with grace. That minute that son chooses to come home, he's received and welcomed. And it's a time for celebration, even as our, our verse of the week, it said, um, there is, Jesus said, there's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God loves to celebrate when we come home. And he fill, kills the fatted calf for us. And so, here's the older brother. Who sh he kind of represents more or less the kind of the religious folks. As Jesus is talking, telling this parable, the younger son is those re rebellious ones, the people that are just out there, ordinary, everyday folks. But... Uh, the older son kind of represents those, those religious leaders, the ones Jesus sometimes had issues with. But here again, you know, it's like, as a religious person, as one who's been walking close with God all of his time, he of all people ought to be the happiest that his brother has returned. Yea, the sinner has repented. He's seen the error of his ways, and he's come home. And he should be happy, but he's not. He's like, what the heck? is going on here. Well, there's a party going on. Your brother's come home and dad's killed the fatted calf for him. Um, he, he gets angry. Uh, you know, I think, because he's living in a, under a system. He's got an idea of, like this meritocracy. Everything's about what we earn. And so, you know, he doesn't really understand about grace. And so he thinks, I've got to do it all myself. Everything I get is what I have earned. And so if I've got more than you, it's because I'm better than you. I've done a better job than you. And so here he's looking at this and thinking, well, what in the world? Why have I knocked my, why have I bothered being good? What did it get me to be good? You know, he, I mean, he kind of accuses his father of being stingy. It's like he never even let me have a goat to celebrate with my friends, you know. And, but look at the heart of the father once again. The father Again, no condemnation, but he just, he's, but you're my son. You're my beloved son. Everything I have is yours. You've been with me all this time. And so he loves him. He shares that love, you know. Stop thinking of yourself as different, but you are my beloved son. You've always been with me. Come into the party. Come in and celebrate. You know, we had to do this thing. Yeah, your brother made a mistake. Okay, but he's home. He's come home. He's repented. And this is what's important. So come in. Welcome all of those. So as I, we notice that God welcomes everybody. The invitation is for all, whether you are the, identify as the rebellious or the religious. I mean, some of us grew up in the church and think, you know, we've always been good people. But we all need to hear that invitation. We all need to come and realize the invitation is for us, every one of us, called to be sons and daughters of God. There's a place at the table for you and your name written right there at the little place card. Don't miss out on that invitation. Be sure to answer in the positive. Say, yes, Lord. I want to be there. Yes, Lord, I'm coming. And when we get our Thanksgiving dinner invitations, we say, well, what can I bring? Okay, bring the sweet potatoes. Bring a piece of pie, or bring a pie. We come to God, he says, what can we bring? There ain't nothing we can bring. Just bring our hearts, ready to love the Lord, let it open up. You know, wherever we've wandered, wherever we've strayed, whatever those things we've done in the past, we let it go. There's no condemnation when we come. We kneel at the cross. 
We are sons and daughters of a king, and we are welcome. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have set a table in the presence of our enemies, in the presence of of yourself, even. Lord, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that shows just how much you love us. So, Father, help us today to remember that, that you love us, even though we continue to fall short, even though we continue to go our own direction and think that we can do it on our own. We have rebellious hearts. But Lord, we want to serve you. We want to be with you. Thank you for showing us that there is a better way to walk with you, to be obedient. Lord, we ask, we pray for our loved ones today, some of whom may be gathering around our tables this this week. Father, if there are those who haven't yet accepted the invitation into your kingdom, Father, that this week they might open their hearts. Lord, grant us the, the right words to say that will help someone to come one step closer to Christ. And Father, we pray for those family relationships, maybe or other relationships where there might be a strain. Maybe there will be somebody who's not at the table this, this time because of broken relationship. So we pray for healing in that area. So there's always Christmas. Maybe we can try again, extend an invitation. Thank you for the healing power of your love, for the restoration that you alone can give. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.